Good morning and welcome everyone. Um, in normal times, we'd be getting together for an investor event or a board meeting or, or some type of uh, action like that. But as you all know, these are very extraordinary times. I'm pleased that uh, video technology has allowed us to uh, get together and communicate in a meaningful way. But I must say, if I don't get a haircut pretty soon, uh, the next uh, conference we're gonna have is gonna be with the US mail and we're gonna send letters. Um, before we jump in, I do want to thank uh, my team for putting this together, uh, new for us, specifically uh, Laura and Sydney, who've done a, a wonderful job uh, figuring out Zoom and, and all the trappings around it. A uh, couple housekeeping items I want to get into before we launch. Um, all attendees will be muted, uh, but you are encouraged to submit your questions uh, using the Zoom tab that you should see. Uh, we're, we've allowed a few minutes for Q&A after each section. The webinar today is being recorded and the recording will be sent to all attendees and a, uh, uh, it will also be posted on the Sun Corridor website uh, earlier, uh, later this week. You know, we recognize that the, the world uh, has changed dramatically in a few short weeks. We went from a booming economy to a crisis overnight. So the goal of this webcast is to have us act as a conduit to provide key updates and best practices to assist our, uh, our primary employers navigate this crisis. There's been a lot of work done uh, in communicating uh, uh, some of the federal response and that kind of stuff, but not a lot to help the, the primary employers. So that's what we're really launching. We have a very informative and uh, I think uh, impactful program today. I've asked several of our um, leading healthcare professionals to join me today. Uh, on the webcast, we have Judy Rich, President and CEO of Tucson Medical Center. We have Chad Whalen, President and CEO of Banner Health. And we have Nancy Johnson, President and CEO of El Rio, that are all gonna uh, uh, jump in in just a minute. I've asked these healthcare professionals to address several topics uh, and issues today in their, in their comments. Uh, including where things stand today in the healthcare system, uh, their approach to tackling this uh, uh, pandemic, and third, maybe they can give us a little preview uh, of the future as they see it. I've also asked George Hammond, director of the Eller College uh, Economic and Business Research Center at the U of A to discuss the latest forecast uh, for the economy. Once again, once the speakers have presented, uh, we'll take questions from the participants. Before we do jump into the panel, I did want to give you a, a, uh, a little bit of a snapshot of what the Sun Corridor team has been working on. Uh, we've been very busy working with the 73 projects in our pipeline. Uh, I've asked my team and they've launched very aggressively in reaching out to all the companies in our pipeline to touch base with them over the last several weeks. About uh, some interesting facts for you, about 45% of the projects in our pipeline uh, are moving forward as if nothing's happened. They're actively in site search, uh, continuing negotiations, um, and just moving forward as business as usual. Not surprisingly, about 50% of the companies in our pipeline have taken a hiatus or put things on hold. And what we're hearing is an average of about 30 to 45 days to see where the world ends up after that period of time. Now, surprisingly, about 7% of our pipelines, uh, of our pipeline are, are new projects, and uh, we found that very encouraging. So things are moving forward. I will tell you, in addition, there is some good news out there, and in addition to the Catholic Universities of America uh, announcing a, a new satellite uh, campus in Tucson, we anticipate uh, two of our projects uh, signing a lease uh, by the end of May. So I, I guess there, there's some, uh, some uh, sunshine uh, among the clouds that are out there. The second thing that we are uh, working on right now is we begin, we've been working on the uh, uh, development of a recovery plan. What does the world look like when we come out of this? So our team is actively, again, reaching out to the region's primary employers, not just the companies in our pipeline, and we're assessing the current situation and, and garnering feedback from, from you all, from, from the top employers, uh, to begin formulating a strategy uh, and recommendations for recovery that we can share with our policymakers on, on how we're gonna get out of this. 
Now, that's all good news, but we all know that recovery won't begin uh, until we can ensure the health and safety of people. And the efforts and successes of our hospitals and our healthcare workers it, it really is the first step with that recovery. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Our first panelist uh, is Judy Rich, president of, again, uh, and CEO of Tucson Medical Center. Judy, I'm gonna start with you, if we could. Um, and if you can take of you know five to six minutes and uh, have you address a few things, uh, one the give us an overview of where things stand today for you, number of patients uh, with COVID, uh, are you keeping pace? The challenges around that, if you can describe your approach uh, in tackling the pandemic, uh, treatment, testing, um, and you're also a large employer. Uh, how are you handling your workforce? Furloughs, layoffs any shift in, among the, the workforce. And then third, if you can give us a preview of the healthcare response from your hospital over the next 60 days, when you think we might hit the peak, if we've hit the peak. So let's go ahead and, and jump in with Judy, if you'll go ahead and take it from here. Thank you, Joe. I'm very happy to be here today and tell you a little bit about what's going on here at Tucson Medical Center. Um, so I'll start with where things are today. Uh, today, we have 22 patients in the hospital that are uh, COVID positive. Uh, many of those patients are in our ICU and are being ventilated. As you've heard um, on the news about this disease, it's a respiratory uh, virus primarily. We have um, really seen uh, the worst of it, I think, at this point. Um, you may have heard of the Institute for Healthcare Metrics and Evaluation, which is a group at the University of Washington, founded by Bill Gates. Uh, they have been doing a lot of predictive modeling throughout this crisis. And we learned on Friday that uh, our peak here in Arizona was actually April 10th. And that was a big change because we had heard um, and had been reading from them that it was going to be April 30th, May 1st, when we were gonna see the worst of it. And in fact, it would appear that at some level, we have already seen the, uh, the peak of this disease in terms of the hospital. So our process here at TMC was to set up a, a incident command center on March 17th. Uh, it's a FEMA model. And we invited the 162nd wing guard in to uh, help us to do that, give us some advice and some criticism, uh, which they were very kind to do. And at that point, we then went through the same kinds of processes that I think most hospitals in the country have gone through in this last five weeks. We um, made decisions about personal protective equipment and how much we should be uh, availing our staff and physicians uh, of. We, we made a decision to go to total masking in the hospital so every single person front uh, patient facing or not started wearing a mask. And we set up um, some COVID specific units in the hospital to manage any patient who tested positive for the disease. Uh, the process was, uh, I think, largely successful. We have been fortunate to have enough personal protective equipment. I know that you've heard from uh, many places across the country that that was a problem for them. We have had sufficient protection for uh, the, the people who are working here. And we've also had sufficient ventilators for the support that our patients needed in the, um, in the event that they needed respiratory assistance. Our medical staff has been amazing. Uh, our anesthesiologists became uh, critical care physicians to help our critical care uh, uh, physicians take care of these very sick patients. And, I'm, I'm happy to report that today things feel much better. We started to see a gradual decline in severity of illness over the last week or so, and the hospital is very stable today. We have tested over a thousand patients, um, not really a lot considering the, uh, the, the desire to test more, and that has been the same kind of constraints you've heard in other places. We just have not had the availability to the test kits and the turnaround time that we needed. About 10% of the patients that we test are testing positive. 
And we've had so far in the last several weeks, uh, 18 patients who have died here at TMC from the, from the COVID uh, disease. We um, have had one of our biggest challenges uh, for all of us has been that we had to start canceling elective surgery from the very beginning. Uh, that was a very responsible decision that was made not only by TMC, but all the hospitals in town. And of course, the governor came out and assisted us with that decision by uh, declaring that any patient who could wait uh, needed to wait so that we would not run out of PPE or put any further strain on our resources. Um, because of the fear of the disease, a lot of people are staying home. We've seen dramatic declines in our volume. A hospital that typically has 500 patients a day, we are now running somewhere between 300 and 350. It's a little bit better in the last uh, 10 days or so than it was before. Our emergency department is seeing about half the patients that we typically see. And we're finding that people are fearful of coming to the hospital. So I think the message continues to be that we have processes in place to protect um, our staff and our physicians. And we have um, taken all the appropriate uh, steps to do that. We have had to furlough staff. Uh, we probably had across the organization about 30% of our staff that are not working. Many of them are taking their earned time off to get a full paycheck. And that, um, that, that um, mandatory reduction in hours has been at every single level of the organization, including all of our leadership, has taken a, um, a reduction in uh, pay and in hours. Uh, our clinics out in the community have seen an even more dramatic decline in their visits in our primary care offices. Um, and we've had to do similar kinds of um, furloughing and reduction in hours there. Uh, we are continuing to provide benefits for all of our employees, no matter how many hours they're working. And so that I think is the right thing for us to do as an employer. So uh, a preview of the next um, 60 days. Uh, we are hopeful that in the right, under the right guidelines and with the support of our medical staff that as the governor starts to open up elective surgery, we will be able to start doing that again safely and carefully with the right uh, selection of patients. We are uh, hoping that we can close one of the units that we've been using outside of the ICU for COVID patients. And we're hoping to slowly start bringing the staff back. Uh, they've been amazing and supportive in all of our efforts, although somewhat fearful at times about what this is going to mean for us long term. It's hard for me to picture a, a dramatic increase in our work and in patients coming to the hospital uh, because of the, the associated fear and need for us to continue to be distanced from each other. But my, my hope is that we will proceed carefully and deliberately and that we will find the healthcare system um, willing and able to care for whoever needs to be here. And I'll leave it there, Joe. Okay, technology glitch. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Judy. Um, that was uh, very informative and, and, and I might uh, add, uh, I, I think encouraging in my mind uh, for that update. Uh, our next speaker is Chad Whalen, President and CEO of Banner Health. Chad, the same questions go to you. Uh, overview of where things stand today, uh, describe your approach in tackling this pandemic, and then a little preview of the next 60 days. Chad, uh, without further ado, I'll turn it to you. Sure. Just, uh, okay. Um, so I think much of uh, our approach has been very similar to what Judy said. So I'll try and highlight um, mostly uh, things that are a little bit um, different, but I would say overall very similar. We uh, stood up an incident command center, um, very similar approach. Uh, we've actually been talking on a regular basis, Judy and myself. Um, and then we also um, you know, linked to our banner corporate structure too, which has its incident command center, so coordinating um, with them. 
one of the advantages that brought us is that Colorado uh, was out in front of us in terms of the numbers of patients in the surge, so we did uh, get some early learnings from them. So let me start about uh, with an overview of where things stand today. Um, the vast majority of our testing has actually been done in the ambulatory and the ED setting, and you know, the th of the thousands of tests, um, the majority of these, whether positive or negative, most people have actually been uh, able to be managed at, safely at home. Um, in the inpatient setting, uh, although we do track COVID positive numbers, the, the number that we are most concerned about is actually the patients under enhanced precautions, and that's what we publish on a daily basis to our teams, because that includes not only those with positive tests, but those awaiting tests, and importantly, those in which the test may be negative, but the concerns are so high that it might be a false negative that we're still treating them as though they're COVID patients. So we are at our highest point, um, around 75 patients in the two hospitals in this status. Certainly not all of them have COVID, but they're all under investigation. Um, but importantly, this has been holding steady for just over a week too. So um, we were seeing a steady increase and now it looks like it may be leveling off as well. In terms of, are we keeping pace? Um, yeah, we definitely, um, from all the important measures, you know, rooms to care for the patients, equipment and medications to treat them, and as Judy was referencing, the PPE, keeping our people safe, um, and then also the people to care for them who have the special expertise in that. So we are absolutely keeping pace, and um, uh, we have a lot of capacity left, and hopefully we will never need it, but if we need it, we certainly um, uh, are ready to take care of more. You know, in terms of how we approached uh, the pandemic, um, again, this, the structure of using the Incident Command Center, I think most healthcare systems have done that. Um, let me talk a little bit about testing and treating, um, very similar to what Judy said in terms of the approach uh, in many ways. Um, we did have a fair bit of uh, uh, testing presence, both in our EDs as well as in ambulatory sites. Um, we've been following the CDC guidelines and also the statewide guidelines um, for testing. These change on a regular basis. They actually just changed again over the weekend. Um, so as of today, we can test more people than before. Um, we're now we're at the goal of testing many more symptomatic people as opposed to just high-risk patients, which we were guided um, last uh, week to do. Um, we test primarily in the hospital, our EDs, and then in two of our specific ambulatory sites. Again, the majority of these patients, the best treatment is to stay home and quarantine. Um, for those that do require hospitalizations, most of the care is supportive. Um, there's no great medical uh, pharmacologic treatment that we know about yet. Um, for those that end up in the intensive care unit, and particularly on a ventilator, um, we are fortunate that we have an incredible pulmonary team that's been using the prone uh, position, um, and that's putting the patient on their stomachs which you probably have read about for a while, for years in patients with lung injuries similar to COVID. So we're very comfortable using that and we use that um, whenever needed. Um, and then we also are participating in some of the clinical trials for some of the novel treatments, such as the convalescent serum that you may have read about as well. But far and away, the most important thing is good supportive care and then uh, for lower risk people to quarantine. As Judy said, the workforce has been um, really a challenge. Um, and I would say this is one of the most difficult professional tightropes I've ever, have, have ever had to walk. You know, we're building up a workforce to prepare for a surge that could have overwhelmed us, um, while at the same time uh, electively shrinking a very large portion of our business. Um, and it's caused major financial stresses on us, but I think all of healthcare. But our staff have been truly amazing, um, stepping up, retraining, to prepare for surge in ways they never would have thought imaginable. And while we've been able to hold off um, and use our typical flexing strategies until now, just this week we have started short-term rotating furloughs, um, very similar to the uh, process that uh, Judy was talking about at TMC, with the goal of bringing our people back as soon as we can in full force to handle what we're calling you know, the recovery phase. Um, you know, what does the next 60 days look like? Um, I don't know. I'm optimistic, but cautious. Uh, there are a lot of projection tools out there, and they all tell us a little bit different story, and I think um, we need to think about them as guideposts and not fact. Um, most are saying we're either just past our peak or maybe it's coming up, but it does look like the surge here is not going to be the worst case scenario that we've all been planning for, which is uh, wonderful news. And so we are gearing up to reopen um, in a very safe uh, and effective way, and this is a wonderful thing. Um, but I will say the, sur the virus ultimately will tell us when our surge is done, 
And then the other piece that I would just have us all remember is that the chance that COVID just disappears in humans after this initial surge is, is really quite low. And so we will be living with COVID in our future, whether it's chronic and intermittent or whether it's seasonal surges. And so in healthcare, we're all trying to figure out how do we deliver the care that we all need to for the bulk of our patients while still being able to keep everyone safe in the uh, COVID uh, situation. And with that, um, I will stop as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chad. Again, very informative. Um, our final um, presenter uh, under this topic is Nancy Johnson, President and CEO of El Rio. Nancy, you, uh, um, you're really on the front lines and uh, we've been looking forward to this conversation. So without further ado, Nancy, I'll let you take it. Uh, same questions, overview of where things stand today, your, uh, your approach to tackling the pandemic and a preview of the, uh, of, uh, of the future of the next 60 days. Sounds good. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today. And um, I, was, I was just so appreciative of listening to Judy and Chad, and that was really encouraging for us here. And um, as Joe mentioned, you know, being out here with our 12 community locations, we see our goal to keep um, patients away from the emergency room, Judy. That's why your emergency room rates are lower, maybe. But seriously, we've been really working hard to keep everyone healthy and work in the areas of primary and secondary prevention. So we brought our incident command center up March 17th as well, and uh, deployed that around making sure that our health centers were safe. So we have consolidated for the smallest health centers and with the larger health centers, but have maintained those 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. hours and Saturday so people could reach us with their concerns. We've seen a lot of people really anxious and worried. Um, our call centers volume went up by about 40% just with people calling, wanting to talk to their healthcare provider, talk to the nurse about what they should do with any of their symptoms and worrying about that. Um, we also saw about three weeks ago our in-person patient volume drop by 50%. And I have to really um, uh, give kudos. I'm very impressed with our workforce because we had been offering some telemedicine to our patients as an option. So we had the technology available, but we went through our, with about 113,000 patients, we went through our population health stratification, pulled up our patients who were high risk, we sent over 100,000 text messages out to educate patients about social distancing and hand hygiene and, and all the primary prevention education we could. Um, we have remained very, very fortunate with enough PPE for everyone. Um, test kits, we usually on a weekly basis have about 500 test kits, so we have been judiciously using those with patients that present. Um, I think that uh, we've also done lots of partnership with the Pima County Health Department. As the health department's been identifying small clusters of positive COVID, we've been sending out our employees to swab those apartment complexes, senior living complexes, to help kind of get a hold of that before it would overwhelm um, any of the hospitals or the community. Um, we've also been working in partnership with the city of Tucson and that we probably have on any given day about 600 individuals who are homeless or living in the shelters around the community and you know living and sleeping in the dormitory sort of locations they're living in uh, could really uh, contribute to community spread. So we've been working on some partnerships with some of the hotels in town and last week started you know moving symptomatic people away from the asymptomatic and doing a lot of isolation and quarantining. Um, we have been really fortunate when we jumped on to using telemedicine for our patients, we're up to about 85% of our normal daily patient care volume using telemedicine. So it's been interesting um, how uh, our providers have really jumped into innovation when the need presented itself when our clinics are half empty on a daily basis. Um, I think uh, the other factor we've been working on with community, uh, some of you may have seen the K-Gun story on Saturday, our partnership with Borderland Bre Breweries who has been making hand sanitizer for us. So we've been able to keep that supply coming as well as many generous donations have come to El Rio to help take care of our patients, help provide 
uh, transportation and food and shelter for some of the most vulnerable individuals. Um, in terms of our workforce, we have just simply furloughed our per diem teams um, and have been able to keep all of our employees working, but they've all been very flexible. We've displaced them into multiple areas that needed additional work. We have some of our employees that are actually doing more high touch surface cleaning in all of our clinics. Um, we had to close our dental clinics, of course, early on and just kept two of them open for emergencies. So we have a lot of our dental employees that have been working on med adherence with some of our high risk patients. We have a whole team that every day at the start of every shift at Tucson Electric Power Plant goes out, takes temperatures, looks for uh, symptoms with the workforce out there. So we have been working with that essential workforce to be sure that they all don't become ill at the same time. So we've been very creative in keeping our employees working. And we, of course, do have employees who um, are staying home, using their earned time off, um, and also people who are high risk in our workforce who've elected to stay home. So uh, we feel very grateful that we have been able to keep uh, the workforce going. Um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just so encouraged by listening to the hospital reports today about when the surge, if the surge has already happened or what we can expect. But I think that um, from an organizational view, what we have already learned is that disruptive innovation can be hugely powerful as it has been with our telehealth and gaining experience and having our patients really enjoy that experience as an option to face-to-face -face care. Um, I think we found that all the drilling we have done year in and year out with Pima County around emergency preparedness has paid off as we watched our staff um, you know, rise to meet the challenges. Um, I think also in 60 days, um, we will continue to see ourselves being stronger um, as an organization in terms of the cross training that has gone on, um, staff going from different sites wherever help is needed for the day. And um, I'll stop there, Joe. Thank you, Nancy. Um, well, thank you, thank you everyone. Uh, you know, I know I feel very encouraged to, to, to live in a community with such uh, progressive healthcare organizations, and, and I applaud your, all of you, your, your leadership uh, during this, this crisis. Um, I do know we have some time for questions, and we got some questions coming in from the audience. Um, so I, in no particular order, let me, uh, let me uh, ask you this, and all three of you can jump in on this, and maybe we'll uh, just start back with Judy since you started this. Um, first question we have here under my nose, um, are you uh, having any supply chain issues? Uh, do you anticipate any supply chain issues in the future? So Judy, why don't I start with you and let you. We are, we are not uh, experiencing supply chain issues, but we are not getting comfortable with the fact that it's going to stay that way um, because we are using so much more uh, PPE than we ever did before. We are um, trying to get ahead of it using our suppliers to our best ability, but we're competing with the rest of the country and over time we don't see the need for the masking and the gowning and the gloves uh, ever really going away. I think it's a new normal for us. So we're being very diligent and putting a lot of energy into making sure that we have ongoing supplies. Jad, anything to add on that? Yeah, real similar story. Um, we are keeping a very close eye on it, but we are uh, heads above the water all the time at this point. I think the um, at some point we will need to learn as a industry as, as well as a country about how we get a little bit more uh, flexible in the supply chain uh, that can be more responsive to rapid changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nancy. Yeah, and you know, we're kind of second tier in that when the PPE, the first distribution from the strategic stockhold came into Arizona, uh, it all went to the hospitals as well it should be. So out in the community, we've had to be a little more creative with regional contacts, with other organizations that work as we do in community. Um, and we've had a lot, once again, a lot of people approach us with donations from various insurance companies, um, distributors, and things like that. Great, thank you. Um, then a question came in. Um, 
what, what can we learn from this pandemic that can help us in the future? Uh, let's well, start, Nancy. we'll go in reverse order. Nancy, why don't you take this? Oh, oh. <laughs> oh I don't know. I think uh, um, never be too, um, <laughs> too confident that we have the systems in place that we need to address anything emerging, uh, any emerging diseases. I think we felt a little overconfident in how we would address this. Um, so I think that's always be aware. I think um, sharing more information, building more redundancies into distribution channels, and um, also trying to be as efficient as you can in managing your operations um, so that you have the staff you need to uh, address something like this, but you don't have to put people in furlough. Chad, same question. Yeah, so uh, very similar thoughts and uh, two other uh, additions. One is I want to reflect back on something Nancy said before is I think that there'll be an opportunity for us to all learn about some transformative changes that we've had to make in weeks as opposed to over years and um, which of those we want to continue using to deliver care. And I think telehealth would be one we probably all answer. Um, we're going to be looking for ways to continue that. Um, the second piece I would say is that um, you know, I think the lessons learned from Ebola probably served us actually poorly because we all thought that was going to be an easily, you know, the next uh, scary thing would be an easily identified, um, relatively well contained from a geographic area as opposed to, um, you know, the prior pandemics, which we probably should have uh, learned a little more from, which is, you know, at any given moment, we're going to be facing one of these things. When it comes, who knows, but we've got to figure out how to deliver care and keep an economy going. Um, with uh, a pandemic in our midst. And Judy, same question. Uh, we've learned that we are very vulnerable and that as smart as we think we are in this country, that uh, we did not have the answers. Um, and I, I also think that we have learned that we need each other in a different way. Um, I have really appreciated uh, Chad's um, friendship and his responsiveness as he and I have texted each other on almost a daily basis. Um, how are you handling this? What are you doing? Um, the County Health Department, as Nancy mentioned, uh, has been um, a source of, of help for us and a convener for us. So we uh, have come together in a different way because of this, and that's a good thing. Encouraging. Um, question just came in. Uh, read this one very close. Uh, what are your recommendations uh, to have employees return to, to work? So Judy, you've got the floor. Why don't you take it and run back around the other way. So what are your recommendations so, to have people, employees return to work? It says. So I think th that question is about non-healthcare employees yes. uh, returning to work. Um, I think that um, if they're productive, you need to leave them home uh, as long as, as you can. If they're not productive, you need to figure out how to get them productive. <laughs> Um, and I think, uh, I think Chad said this before, the data will tell us. Uh, it's going to be not real subjective, I hope. The data will tell us when people can go back to work and at what kind of a rate. Okay. Chad, anything to add? Yeah, I, I don't, don't really have anything to add to that one. I would just say, um, please do pay attention to the data and, uh, um, you know, Keep people at home and as long as they're productive and you keep them safe, um, that's great. Yeah. The data will tell us. <laughs> you know, we have a lot of employees that we have sent home to work and part of our discussion was how do we know if they're productive at home? <laughs> and so uh, our managers did a lot of work around measuring productivity, setting goals and standards for accomplishments and, you know, I kind of wonder some of them might be more productive at home. <laughs> but we're leaving everybody at home right now, too. Well, we're uh, quickly running out of time. Uh, let, me, let me ask you one more question uh, uh, that I have that if I can ask you to, to, you know, in 15, 20 seconds at the most, uh, uh, give me your answer, that'd be great. And that last question is, how can we all make a difference to help you? How can we help you uh, during these challenging times? Nancy, why don't you go ahead? Social distancing, do what is asked, uh, be there to support when questions come your way. 
we, you know, as you mentioned earlier, Joe, we have a really supportive community and we have seen that. Thank you, Nancy. Chad, I can help you. Yeah, same thing. And the only, the only thing I would uh, stress is that um, we don't know what's going to look like in 60 days, 90 days, 180 days. And so um, just keep paying attention and uh, supporting the community uh, for the duration. And I will, I will just add um, that you need to get on telehealth with your doctor. Uh, our physicians are ready and able and wishing that you would call them and uh, do a telehealth visit with them. Check in. Uh, don't be a hero. Uh, don't ignore mm -hmm. signs or symptoms that you might be having. Uh, there are lots of capabilities in this community for you to check in with the physicians, so you need to be doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, all of you. Um, this has been very informative and, and uh, really opened my eyes and I think very encouraging. Um, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your leadership and your dedication being on the front lines. So thank you uh, for, for your time this morning. Um, you know, the impacts of this pandemic have hit this economy hard. We're all reading these stories and, and we all have a sense that it's bad. How bad? Uh, I guess that's why we have George here. So he's going to jump in and tell us how long and how bad this recession will be. Uh, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to George Hammond. And George, if you can give us a little insight to the best of your ability of uh, where we're sitting with the economy through all this. George Hammond, please. Thanks, Joe. Um, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for the opportunity to share with you what we know of where the economy is and where it's headed. So I'm going to share some slides with you now. I will go ahead and do that. And uh, I don't have very many of them, so we'll just kind of talk through them. So the economic outlook. Now the key thing to keep in mind about the, the economy going forward is that there is a huge amount of uncertainty about where the economy is headed. And what's driving that is uncertainty about how the outbreak is going to progress in coming weeks and months. So there's a lot of uncertainty about how the outbreak is going to progress. And that means there's a lot of uncertainty about how the economy will perform. We don't know how severe the downturn is going to be, in part because we don't know how long it will take to get control over the outbreak. And likewise, we don't know when the recovery will begin and what the recovery will be like. And again, it's, the, it's this uncertainty about how the outbreak will progress that drives the economic uncertainty. So that's something that we're, we're going to have to watch very carefully. The, the progression of the outbreak and when we get control of it is really going to drive the economic out. So a lot of uncertainty there. But what we know is that the Arizona, Phoenix, and Tucson economies were in quite good shape before the, the outbreak began. So Arizona, Phoenix, and Tucson were all generating strong job income and population growth. In fact, Tucson growth uh, here was the fastest that we had seen since 2006, so the fastest in more than a decade. But unfortunately, that's the past. Where we're headed is for a major downturn. And what we're going to experience is major job income and retail sales losses uh, across the nation, and that will be true here in Arizona as well. Now, the first sectors to be hit were in the travel and tourism industry, but as, as we're seeing now, it's spread to retail trade, into healthcare with dentists and, and doctor's offices and hospitals, uh, furloughing and or laying off employees, um, you know, murderers, hair and nail salons are laying off, uh, child care uh, firms are laying off. So it's quite widespread and it's going to get more widespread as we move through, uh, as those impacts ripple through the rest of the economy. So every sector uh, in the state is going to suffer uh, fairly major job losses. So we are 
the aggressive responses from the federal fiscal and monetary authorities. Um, we are seeing significant fiscal relief, um, but you want to keep in mind that uh, the, the uh, federal policy responses are not going to be enough to eliminate the downturn. They will help to cushion it, but not eliminate it. And finally, the outlook calls for a return to growth, but only once the outbreak is under control. So the outbreak is going to drive everything. What happens with the virus will drive when and how we recover. So a little bit of um, uh, happier days. 2019, we were seeing strong growth across uh, Arizona in terms of the number of new jobs generated. Arizona created about uh, 80,000 net new jobs last year for 2.8% growth. Uh, Phoenix grew even faster at 3.3%. Tucson uh, generated the fastest job growth since 2006, 7,000 net new jobs last year. Uh, Arizona, Phoenix, and Tucson all generated faster job growth than did the U.S. Uh, last year. We can drill down into Tucson with, in a little bit more detail by using a, a nice graphic from the MAP dashboard. This shows you the indicators that we track in the economy category, and they range from business growth to employment growth. Uh, we have uh, housing affordability, median household income patents, and real GDP. Now the next column over shows you the latest observation for each of those indicators. The third column shows you an icon-based ranking system. And if you see a sun, Tucson ranks in the top third among the 12 Western metros that we track. A partly sunny icon, is Tucson's in the middle. A cloudy icon, Tucson ranks in the bottom third. And a thunderstorm icon, Tucson ranks last out of the 12 Western metros. And you can see that there are a couple bright spots in the local economy. Uh, housing affordability was relatively good. 66.2% of single family houses were affordable to a family making the median uh, income. Uh, we also performed relatively well in terms of patent activity, and that's a good thing because that reflects innovative activity, and it's really that innovation that drives growth in our long-term standard of living. We're in the middle of the distribution in terms of real GDP growth. Um, and uh, also now in the middle of the distribution in terms of job growth, which is a big improvement over our performance last year. However, we are uh, in the bottom third in terms of median household income and, and uh, last in terms of business growth. So there are some bright spots in the Tucson economy, um, but certainly plenty of room for improvement before the outbreak hit. But nowadays we're all thinking about what the outbreak means for the economy. So on uh, our Arizona's Economy Online magazine, uh, we track uh, the number of uh, uh, COVID cases on a daily basis. This is a graph that tracks uh, the cases through last Friday. Uh, most of the cases are in Maricopa County. Uh, cases in Pima County uh, come in second though. So the, the virus is clearly proceeding through the local area. Now the, the impact of social distancing, both the government imposed social distancing and the self imposed social distancing has had a huge impact on uh, employment, on the labor market. Uh, initial claims, uh, weekly initial claims are one way we can track this rapidly moving uh, impact. Um, in Arizona, initial claims for unemployment insurance for the week ending uh, March 14th, we're just over 3,800, but notice that um, it rises quickly to 29,000, then up to almost 89,000, then over 132,000. Last week, the, uh, these initial claims were uh, fell a bit um, back down into the 98,000 range. But if we add all those up, that's uh, just over 350,000 uh, initial claims for unemployment insurance or think of those as 350,000 jobs lost uh, in just a few weeks. And the nation is experiencing the same thing. We're seeing uh, roughly 22 million initial claims for unemployment insurance uh, in the past uh, four to five weeks. 
So let's talk a little bit about the outlook for Arizona, Phoenix, and Tucson. And these uh, detailed forecasts are still um, under construction. I'll be releasing them uh, uh, over the next week or so. But I can give you the basic outlines. And these um, state and local forecasts are driven by a national forecast. And that national forecast calls for U.S. real GDP growth to fall um, by about 3% in the first quarter of 2020 at an annual rate. Uh, the second quarter is uh, really terrible with um, about a 26 to 27% drop in real GDP. And then a smaller drop again in the third quarter before we start to grow again in the fourth quarter of the year. But you wanna keep in mind that that is all premised on the assumption that social distancing, both government imposed and self imposed begins to ease significantly in the July and August time period. And that allows the economy to start to bounce back. Now, what does all that mean for Arizona, Phoenix and Tucson? That means that we're gonna experience huge job income and retail sales losses, even in the baseline scenario. Now, these job losses are gonna be much, much worse than even what we experienced during the downturn during 2008 and 2009, what we used to call the Great Recession. Now, the peak to trough with the peak in the fourth quarter of 2019 and us hitting bottom about the third quarter of 2020, um, our job losses across Arizona, Phoenix, and Tucson are all gonna be in the neighborhood of 15% or a little bit greater. For the state as a whole, that means uh, net job losses in the, in the neighborhood of 481,000. Now, unemployment is going to peak well above what we experienced during the 2008 to 2009 time period. Remember, that peak was just about 10.9%. Uh, um, under these baseline assumptions, I think the, the, you know, the Arizona unemployment rate is going to peak um, at around 19% by the fourth quarter of 2020, so much more severe. I do think that the, the outbreak is going to uh, generate slower population growth in the near term. I don't think many people are going to be moving across states uh, in the second quarter, um, probably not very many more. In the third quarter, we'll start to, to gradually get back to something more normal in terms of net migration into Arizona as we get towards the end of the year and into 2021. Uh, that slower population growth is going to impact residential construction in terms of housing permits and overall construction activity. So recovery, if, the, um, if we have the, the virus under control and social distancing begins to, to be relaxed in a meaningful way uh, during that July and August time period, I think we'll start to see uh, recovery bounce back uh, or growth bounce back as we get towards the end of 2020. But it's going to be, I think, late 2022 before we can return the level of uh, jobs, income, and retail sales back to levels that we saw before the outbreak began. You also want to keep in mind that uh, the baseline scenario here is assigned a probability of 45%, and the pessimistic scenario has almost as high a probability at 35%. And the pessimistic scenario uh, imagines much more severe job losses as opposed to about 481,000 jobs lost under the baseline. The pessimistic scenario assumes uh, almost 700,000 jobs lost from peak to trough with an unemployment rate that peaks over 22%. So keep in mind, there's still a lot of uncertainty about how things are going to progress. Uh, and that there's a significant uh, possibility that um, what we actually experience could be significantly worse than even what's envisioned under the baseline. So federal economic policy responses, they've been, been uh, fairly vigorous, particularly the Federal Reserve has aggressively responded to uh, the crisis. We expect um, interest rates to be um, around zero uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, the Fed has restarted uh, lending facilities uh, to provide liquidity to businesses around the nation. And the Fed is also uh, aggressively returning to quantitative easing. Federal fiscal policy response has also ramped up. Uh, the latest uh, response was the $2.2 trillion CARES Act. 
Uh, that included uh, direct payments to individuals, which many are receiving uh, these days. It also included a significant expansion in unemployment insurance uh, benefits. The Federal uh, CARES Act uh, expands the, the weekly benefit uh, in Arizona from $240 per week as a maximum to $840 per week, and that will continue until the end of July. The CARES Act also extends the length of time uh, during which individuals can claim unemployment insurance benefits by 13 weeks, so from 26 to 39 weeks. Uh, and the legislation also uh, allows states to expand eligibility uh, for unemployment insurance to the self-employed and contract workers, what we now call gig workers. Uh, the CARES Act also expands uh, business support through the Small Business Administration with the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, that program is already tapped out. Uh, Congress is currently negotiating, uh, adding more funds to that, more funds uh, also for healthcare, at least being discussed uh, as of this morning when, uh, when I uh, uh, started to prepare for this webinar. Uh, there's also other uh, support. There's support for state and local governments, also universities and schools, um, as well as uh, additional support for, uh, at least in terms of delayed loan repayment for student loans. So we've done uh, uh, some things, but uh, uh, the key is speed, particularly in the business support. Uh, the uh, small business support has already been uh, exhausted. Um, I think we'll need more of that. And for that matter, I think uh, more overall federal uh, fiscal relief will be required uh, in, in the next uh, coming months. So that's where I think we are at the moment. You want to keep in mind that there is a huge amount of uncertainty in these projections. Uh, what drives that uncertainty is the uncertainty about the outbreak. So um, stop back often. These forecasts will be evolving basically on a monthly basis as we go forward over the, over the coming months. You can find uh, information uh, about uh, the Arizona and Tucson economies. Uh, one good place is the MAP dashboard that's made possible by our uh, sustaining sponsors, the uh, Thomas R. Brown Family Foundations, Tucson Electric Power, and the Freeport Mac Moran Foundation, as well as our partners, um, uh, the Community Foundation for Southern Arizona, the Pima Association of Governments, the Southern Arizona Leadership Council, Sun Corridor, and of course, the University of Arizona. So uh, with that, I'll conclude my, uh, my prepared remarks and uh, send it back to Joe. Thank you, George. Um, I would say uh, uplifting, but I think I'd be lying, but uh, it's, it's real. Um, but thank you, I appreciate you uh, staying on top of this. So we do have some questions from the audience, George. Um, I'll go ahead and read those right now. Uh, first question, um, longer term, do you think that uh, we will see additional migration into Arizona, specifically Tucson, away from the larger or denser cities like New York City, Chicago, those kind of places? Yeah, well, thanks, Joe. Well, that's a hot topic these days. Um, and the, the short answer is, is we don't know yet. My own opinion is that the, the, the cities and regions that get hit the hardest will, will probably seem a bit less attractive as migration destinations. So I wouldn't be surprised um, to see that, that New York might be a, a bit less favorable as a migration destination going forward. We here in Arizona don't draw a lot of migrants from, uh, from the New York City area. Most of the net migrants who come to Arizona come from California uh, and other Western states, particularly Southern uh, California. So we'll see how that plays out. But, um, you know, Arizona will continue, uh, certainly in the long run, to be viewed as a very attractive migration destination. You can't beat the amenities here. Um, I do think population will be slower um, for, you know, a couple of quarters here and then population will rebound and we'll start to see that feedback into increased uh, residential construction, other kinds of residential, other kinds of construction, and overall job growth. Thank you, George. Um, maybe on the heels of this, this, this question is a good one. Uh, do you see uh, manufacturing 
pulling out of markets like China and bringing those operations back to the U.S. or nearshoring, getting closer to the U.S.? Yeah, that's an interesting question. That's something that I think has been has been happening over the past couple of years, and and um, uh, even before the uh, the late the, the current administration took office, there was. Uh, some uh, some nearshoring, uh, putting operations into Mexico that formerly were in China, just to take advantage of the of the uh, supply chains and the connections to to the U.S. Um, I think this will probably result in in some nearshoring, particularly of of uh, medical supplies that maybe weren't seen as a, as as high a priority um previously as they as i think they will be going forward so personal protective equipment and other things maybe near short to make sure that we can uh deal with um with future pandemics um in a somewhat better way well it doesn't look like we have any more questions and i'm a stickler for keeping this we promised one hour and we're coming up on uh I think about one minute, so we want to uh, wrap this up. I'd like to uh, personally thank you, George, Judy, Chad, uh, Nancy, for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to inform us today. I, I think it's very, been very enlightening, and we appreciate all the work that you're uh, you're doing. Um, it appears that on the healthcare front, we have uh, some some a little light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe uh, getting the gritting this tiger by the tail from the healthcare side. On the economy side, it, it looks like we've got a lot of work to do, at, at least in the short term. We do have some experience with the Great Recession. We're, we're, we are a strong and resilient, resilient community, but I think we're gonna have to work harder than we, we ever did before. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, 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 webcast, um, we are working to, to coordinate an economic recovery plan. And Sun Quarter Inc. And, and all of you panelists that are board members and, and all the uh, investors and board members on the on the uh, online here, we're going to be very important and impactful in driving the future economy. Uh, so look forward to uh, us reaching out. We got to get to work in a, in a really meaningful way. With that, I'd like to uh, let you know that we uh, we're going to be creating an economic uh, recovery council. Um, uh, representing many of the sectors that uh, George mentioned um, and representatives from the fe federal, state, uh, local level, both uh, public, private, and academic, so that we can begin to put these strategies in place. We might have to do things very different than we've done them before to accelerate our economy. Now, there's an interesting uh, uh, story in, in Yahoo Business this weekend. And Tucson was mentioned as one of the cities that could that maybe benefit uh, from the, you know, we, it's now the new economy again. We're going to rehash that term, but the new economy post-pandemic, and we want to be ready for it, and we're going to want to have our policymakers ready for it, so that if we need to put new things in place that we haven't thought of before, we need to do that. So we're going to get to work on that. The second thing, uh, the last thing I'd say is uh, our plan is to have more of these uh, uh, webcasts over the coming weeks, so stay tuned and be looking for the invites. With that, uh, I thank you again, all of our panelists for taking time out of your schedule. And uh, I wanna thank also our participants that were online. Uh, please share with us any uh, things that didn't work. Uh, we're, we're figuring this out as we go. And uh, I encourage everyone to be safe and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.